Hello, my name is Harold Hafton, and welcome to Archaeological Minecraft. I'm a former archaeologist who enjoys playing Minecraft and thought it would be fun to combine the two. In today's episode, we're going to build one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Colossus of Rhodes. Now, I bet some of you who saw the thumbnail before reading the title thought this video was going to be about the Titan of Bravos, which is the ginormous 120 meter or 400 foot tall bronze statue that straddled the harbor to the trade city of Bravos in George R.R. R. Martin's epic series, The Song of Ice and Fire. Well, sorry to say, this video isn't going to be about that famous bronze statue, but rather the statue that George R.R. R. Martin based his statue off of. I think you'll see that while there are some similarities between the two famous bronze statues, perhaps what you think you may know about the Colossus of Rhodes might be a bit different than the actual historical statue, and that what George R.R. R. Martin based his statue off of might be more the later myth of the statue as opposed to the historic statue. It also might be that when you saw the thumbnail, you thought, Half Dan, why the heck are you building a big giant bronze robot? Because... That's kind of what this felt like the whole time. Trying to create people is super difficult. So if anyone has tips in the comments about how I can make this thing look more person-like instead of a big bronze C-3PO-like robot, it would be super helpful to hear what those tips and tricks are. The story of the Colossus doesn't begin with the statue itself, but rather with an invasion of the island of Rhodes from 305 to 304 BC by Demetrius of Macedon, son of Antigonus I, otherwise known as Antigonus the One-Eyed, who was one of the successors and generals of Alexander the Great and reigned in Macedon from 306 to 301 BC. You see, when Alexander the Great died, his generals fought amongst themselves and carved up his kingdom. The island of Rhodes was aligned to Ptolemy, another of Alexander's generals who took over the land of Egypt, and his family reigned as its kings and pharaohs until the time of Cleopatra, who was the last pharaoh of Egypt. Though, that's a different story, so let's get back to the story of the Colossus. Rhodes was a rich island and had a central role in Mediterranean trade, and so Antigonus wanted to control the island, so he sent his son with a massive invasion force to the island to put it under siege. In 304 BC, he had to abandon the siege when a release force from Ptolemy arrived and had to leave so rapidly that he had to abandon all his siege equipment, weapons, and many of his supplies. As such, the Rhodians, I'm sure with a nice smile of irony on their faces, sold all the equipment, and with the money they made from the sale, along with the iron and bronze they reclaimed from the siege equipment, funded the creation of a mighty statue of their patron god, Helios, who was the personification of the sun. This statue was placed near the entrance to their harbor, where ships coming to Rhodes for trade would be able to see it as they sailed in or out. Notice I said placed near the harbor and not straddling the harbor. That's one of the first and perhaps the largest misconceptions about the Colossus. I think many of us have seen pictures of the Colossus of Rhodes, and what is it often doing? Yeah, straddling the harbor with ships sailing under it, like in the fictional Titan of Bravos. But there are two reasons why this doesn't work. First is that the descriptions or paintings of it spanning the harbor come later, well after antiquity, either in the writings of a 14th century Italian visitor who passed along word-of-mouth tales from things locals told him, or from a 16th century engraving by Martin Heemkirsch on his series about the seven wonders of the world. We'll get into the destruction of the Colossus a bit later, but suffice to say that the bronze statue and its remains were long gone by likely over 700 years before the time of the Italian visitor's account, and that text is likely where all the subsequent descriptions or pictures are based off of. The second reason why it doesn't make sense for it to have straddled the harbor is really just practical. The statue stood around 32 meters tall, or 105 feet tall, and while it stood on a pedestal that was supposed to be around 15 meters or 50 feet tall and 18 meters or 59 feet in diameter, even at that height, the leg span you would need to span the harbor wouldn't have made sense on a statue 32 meters tall. 
Instead of spanning the harbor entrance, most modern scholars think it was either located near the harbor on a pedestal on the one side of the harbor's entrance, or possibly within a sanctuary of Helios on the Acropolis of Rhodes that later might have become a temple to Apollo. Remember that the Colossus was a statue of Helios, and given that the Acropolis was the highest part of the city, if that theory is correct, situated that way, it would have been seen by any approaching ship coming into the harbor or leaving. All that said, there are very different opinions on the matter as far as where exactly it was located. The construction of the statue started in 292 BC, and the project was given to Chares, a native of Rhodes, who was the pupil of a sculptor who had built a 22-meter or 72-foot-tall statue of Zeus in Tarentum in southern Italy. So he likely knew what he was doing, or at least saw someone who had done it before. The construction took 12 years and was completed by 280 BC. There's a bit of a debate around how the statue was constructed. Philo of Byzantium, who lived from 280 BC to around 220 BC, so basically a generation after the statue's creation, wrote about the construction used on the Colossus and said that it was built in a way and cast differently than was the normal process for bronze statues. He claims that it was cast in place, or in other words, in situ, because the individual sections couldn't be moved because they were so heavy. What he described was this, quote, After the first part had been cast, the second was modeled upon it, and for the following part again, the same method of working was adapted. After the casting of the new course upon that part of the work was already completed, the artist heaped up a huge mound of earth round each section as soon as it was completed, thus burying the finished work under the accumulated earth and carrying out the casting of the next part of the level. So let's break down what he's saying a little bit. Basically, he's saying that they piled dirt over the area that was just cast, and then on top of that level, cast the next section in place, and then repeated that process until the statue was completely finished. I think now might be a good time as I explain this to talk about how casting normally works, seeing how Philo of Byzantium said that it was cast differently, so differently compared to what. When talking about bronze casting, don't think about this as a solid bronze statue. Instead, think of a bronze outer shell with a supporting framework inside of wood, stone, or iron. Normally, when bronze is cast, a process called the lost wax process is used. With this process, you start by creating a central core of clay and then place the wax over top that central core. In ancient times, beeswax was used. The wax was poured on or coated to the thickness you wanted the eventual bronze thickness to be. For the Colossus, that thickness has been estimated to be about 2.5 centimeters or 1 inches thick. Then you carve into the wax to create your design, any intricate work, or just any general shaping you'd want the bronze to take on. Once you're satisfied with the design, and this in the end will be what your bronze will look like, you then coat the wax in a slurry, often of water, clay, and charcoal, and then let it dry. Over that, you place an outer coating of clay, which is allowed to dry. The whole process of lost wax works because of the different melting points between the wax with a low melting point and the clay, which has a higher melting point, used in the outer core and outer coating. Heat is then applied and the wax melts away and is allowed to drain out of the mold, thus creating a cavity within the mold with the exact thickness and style of the carvings of what you are casting. Molten bronze is then poured into the mold, taking the place of what was originally the wax. Everything's allowed to cool and then the mold is broken open, or in the case of a reusable mold, separated in a way that it can be then put back in place and reused. A number of bronze workshops in Rhodes have been excavated. What they show is that normally, large bronze statues were cast in large sections in casting pits. A similar bronze pit was discovered in Athens, which dates to around the time of the construction of the Colossus, that could accommodate large sections up to 15 meters, or around 50 feet. So, how does this apply to the Colossus? Let's go back to what Philo of Byzantium said. Philo had indicated that the Colossus was cast in a way that was different 
from what normally occurs for bronze statues. He said this was necessary because the bronze sections couldn't be moved. That said, many modern scholars think that Philo might be incorrect in his descriptions, or at least incorrect in saying that the normal processes weren't used. Casting like he described isn't really practical, and given that there are other very large casting pits that have been found in a concurrent time frame has led some to conclude that the sections of the Colossus were created in casting pits and then assembled and placed around wooden, iron, or a stone frame, perhaps using some of the remnants of the siege equipment left over from the siege of the city. The Colossus was said to have carved stone feet that were covered with bronze plates and riveted in place. It makes sense to me, and this is only my personal opinion here, that maybe they cast the parts in the casting pits and then built earthen ramps around where the parts of the statue had already been constructed and then used that artificial hill of sorts to pull up the next part to then assemble it onto that next section and then repeated that process until the statue was fully created. Once completed, they removed all the earth surrounding the statue. Remember, Philo was writing his account at least a generation removed from the actual construction, so maybe the methods or all the steps weren't passed down to him 100% accurately. The second misconception or thing you might not know about the Colossus is how long it stood for. Given how famous this statue became, I mean, it's one of the seven wonders of the world. You would think it stood in place for hundreds and hundreds of years throughout the ages of antiquity, thus why it's so famous beyond being just such a large statue. But that isn't at all correct. Just a short 54 years after it was constructed, in 226 BC, the island of Rhodes was hit by a devastating earthquake that caused major damage to the city, its temples and harbor, and brought down the Colossus of Rhodes. It said it broke at the knees and collapsed onto the land. To me, the fact that it fell onto the land points more strongly that it wasn't right on the harbor and certainly not straddling it, or it very likely might have fallen into the sea and not fallen onto the land. Strabo, the Greek geographer who lived from around 64 BC to around AD 24, wrote about the Colossus and said the Rhodians didn't rebuild it because of the advice of an oracle. In any case, it collapsed onto the land and afterwards became a famous place for tourists and visitors to go and visit. Pliny the Elder, a Roman author who lived from around A.D. 23 to A.D. 79, also wrote about the statue, saying how exciting it was to visit, even though it lay on the ground. He said, quote, Few men can clasp the thumb in their arms, and its fingers are larger than most statues. Where the limbs were broken asunder, vast caverns are seen yawning in the interior. Within it, too, are to be seen large masses of rock by the weight which the artist steadied it while erecting it. From that time, the Colossus rested laying on the ground with ancient tourists visiting the Great Wonder all the way up until A.D. 653. That's when Rhodes was captured from the Byzantines during the Arab expansion, and according to the chronicle of Theophanes the Confessor, the bronze in the statue was taken as booty and melted down. That said, I think it's very likely that a statue to a pagan deity, such as Helios, might have well have been taken apart bit by bit over the preceding centuries when Rhodes was Christianized around the 4th century, and thus it was just the last invasion by the Arab forces that melted down the remaining sections, thus removing the Colossus of Rhodes from history, but not from memory. Well, that wraps up this video. I hope you enjoyed my recreation of the Colossus of Rhodes. As always, I put some resources I uncovered while doing my research for this video in the description, so you can check those out if you want to learn more. Make sure you take the time, if you liked my video, to like, subscribe, and all that normal stuff. And if you did like this video, you might also like these other videos I've made about different ancient topics. Here's one where I recreate a Roman aqueduct, and here's another where I talk about the public toilets used by ancient cultures. Thanks. Have a good rest of your day. Bye for now.